Us, us, everyone. Another secret Santa here. Uh, a Merry Christmas to you all as such. And um, a nice surprise, I guess. And myself and Shion Cameron had a chat a week ago, and it was an honor to get his acceptance to chat about his book. So from Tambourine Mountain in the Gold Coast, Shion Cameron Quinn, good morning to you. How are you? Us, Patty. Hope you're safe and well down there. We are. We are. And yourself, all going well? Yes, all good. It's a it's a busy time. We have um, all the birthdays and all the anniversaries and all the celebrations all within a couple of months. So mm. we're smack in the middle of it. Well, listeners, uh, it's uh, another Christmas present, I guess, from the Kilkshin Shuffle, and we got to thank Shion Cameron Quinn because. As most of us, 99.9% .9 of us that are in the Kilkshin martial arts world are aware, he has re-given uh, us his, the, the book, the famous book, The Buddha Karate of Masayama. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to share a little bit of um, updates in regards to if you haven't followed Shian Cameron on his YouTube, cha YouTube channel, uh, please do so. That's a no-brainer. But this will be a fun chat. And then, of course, he's got a famous cup there. Where was that one taken from? Mark. Yeah, beautiful. So let's have a fun chat about the book. And it's such a, a treasured item to so many. And um, I, I wanted to just share my quick experience on it when I first started Kyokushin in 1999-2000. And the book was sitting on Shiambili Polly's desk. And of course, you grab a book as you do, and you just start flicking through it. And uh, gently, Xi'an would say to me, listen, you can have a look at it, but um, just take care of it, please. And and it was a very, you know, subtle, okay, yeah, sure. And I was just sharing with Xi'an Cameron that uh, everyone had to return it back to the dojo appropriately. And um, it was always, you know, given as a, a couple of nights to read it and then come back um, until one student didn't return it back and he almost lost his life. And uh, Xi'an Billy was very, very adamant that it gets returned back. It's such a treasured item to many. So Xi'an, congratulations, firstly, from me and from many others in, in completing it. Yeah, thanks. There must be a book squirrel somewhere, you know, because the number of people who have got mm. in touch and said, I lent the book and it never came back. Mm. So I think there's a, a, a squirrel up a tree with a, a whole a lot of them. <laughs> along with these acorns. <laughs> well, there you go. So, Xi'an, you know, uh, you and I keep in touch often, but, you know, when COVID hit, it gave you a window because of your employment and so forth, and you were starting to, I guess, find a way to finish the, the book because can you share with everyone when it was the first edition was released and, again, you know, how you got to the point where you got, you got to complete it and then let's rehash uh, how it was, you know, started back in 1987, if I believe it was. Yeah, my wife and I have been together for seven years and she said she can't remember a time where I wasn't talking about getting the book done, rewriting yeah. the book. Yeah. And I don't know whether it's across, whether it's my procrastination or whether it's the way things are with work and family and so on. I'm tending towards my procrastination, but... <laughs> At the end of the day, the COVID, mm -hmm. like in so many circumstances, uh, created a window of opportunity where I had the book largely mm -hmm. redone. Uh, but the COVID gave me an opportunity to sit down and focus on it again and, and look for areas in the book that I really felt like I wanted to expand and, uh, and take a little bit. Um, yeah. more, and keeping in mind too, when I first wrote it in 80, excuse me, in 87, mm. I was 27, uh, 28 right. years old. Right. You know, so it was probably a little pretentious of someone, 28 year old, second or third, then whatever it was, to write a book. Um, so now, with the benefit of an extra more than half my life again yeah i um was able to add a few uh, yeah. extra points and also take the points that i'd written about a little deeper i'm happy to say that when i reread it this time mm. with a very very critical uh mind that i didn't find anything that i i kind of scratched my head and thought wow mm. that's i don't 
like that or that's wrong. I'm, I'm glad that I think I got lucky and was on the right track with everything. Yeah. And I think it was just enough uh, that people wanted who wanted to look into certain things could read it, scratch the surface and take it deeper if they wanted to, uh, which I know a lot of people have. Um, but this time I was able to use the benefit of an extra half a lifetime and um, just add a few extra points here and there that I hope will make it even more enjoyable. Yeah. So far, so people who have proofread it and the people who mm. have uh, seen a, a, an ebook copy of it. Yes, yes. Not that yes. I'm preparing it an ebook, but I just no. prepared half a dozen uh, to give to people to check and so sure. on. Yeah. So far, so. Well, you know, in, in 1987, when you first published it and did it, and I've heard the stories of, of you obviously uh, consulting or discussing it with Soso Masayama at that time, and, and he encouraged you, correct? He was, he was, you know, more than happy for you to go forward with it. Well, it was funny because um, it's such a fascinating story. Mm. It's almost miraculous in that I, I needed to get over to Japan to speak to Soso. But in those days, airfares were quite expensive. They're probably no different to what they are today. It's just that they represented a much larger, you know, proportion of, of your, your salary. I mean, a $2,000 airfare back then is the equivalent of about a five or $6,000 airfare today in terms of its, um, its uh, economic value. So I wanted to get, I needed to get over and speak to Soulside, but I'm, you know, <laughs> good airfare, but they just don't come at the right time sometimes, mm. especially at short notice. And then out of the blue, I got a, a phone call from a mate of mine named Pete. He's never phoned, he never phoned me before and he's never phoned me since. And he was, he was a friend of my girlfriend at the time, her cousin. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, hey, da, da, da. he liked Japan. He, you know, he'd lived in Japan for a while and we were chatting away. And he said, oh, by the way, did you hear about those really cheap airfares uh, next week? Next Thursday, I think it was. Can't remember the exact date. Mm. I said, oh, what's that? And he told me, he said, oh, but you've got no chance because they've been sold out for three months. But mm. isn't that amazing that they would actually <laughs> sell airfares that cheap? I thought, yeah. So when he hung up, I rang the travel agent. Right. And I said, well, you got these really cheap airfares for a flight coming up on Friday. Thursday, Friday. And they said, oh, yeah, but they've been sold out for ages. And I said, you sure there's absolutely nothing, 100%? Mm. Said, well, there is one. No, it was the flight was leaving Tuesday. That's right. But there is one opportunity. That we've put two tickets aside for someone. And we said if then. Uh -huh. By Friday lunchtime, we're going to have to sell them on. Friday, 12 o'clock. So I went round at Friday at 11.45 to the agent, which was a, a very um, Japanese tourist only mm. agent that was right out in the sticks in Brisbane. And I'm sitting there watching, looking at my watch, waiting for 12 o'clock to tick over. And 12 o'clock ticks over and I just smile, you know, as I yeah. remember and they go, well, I guess you got your ticket. So I think it was about 300 return. And what it was, was uh, they, the, the airline companies often charter a flight. So there was a Japan festival, a, a, a Japanese uh, cultural festival in Brisbane. So they had a 747 full of performers mm -hmm. coming over and they chartered the flight. So of course, going over the flight's empty so rather than send an empty flight they just fill it up with cheap tickets i see so that's what they do so you can't they're, they're not flexible flares at fares at all they leave on an exact day and they return on an exact day so i got the ticket i ran i went home and i phoned solsai and i said uh, uh I'm, I'm need to come to japan and speak to you about something he said all right when can you come i said Tuesday, I arrive Monday night. He said, I'll see you at the office at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. All right. Uh, so far, so good. Mm -hmm. I 
go around to Solzhe's office, oh, come in, oh, hello, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said, sit down, what do, you, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, I've written a book. And Solzhe kind of goes, oh, shit. And I didn't realize, but a few people had written books about Kyokushin okay. that hadn't received his authority. They, of course. You know, and, and Kyokushin was his... Um, Everything. Well, his copyright. And one of the things that you learn, I think, well, I've learned anyway about writing is that sometimes you think you can fudge it. And maybe back in 87, I could have got away with certain things because there was no internet, no computer, <clears throat> no nothing. But these days, as a writer and as an author, you take a legal responsibility mm. for determining the ownership of every bit of copyright in your book. So sometimes people get books written by someone else. You know, the shadow written books. I'm talking to a mate recently and he's discussing a book about rugby league by Wally Lewis. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually written by Wally Lewis. It was written by a professional ghostwriter. And mm. often what happens is these ghostwriters will fudge the mm. copyright ownership and they don't tell the author. Mm. And the author, of, thought, of course, thinks that all that legal copyright you know, um, IP stuff, the you know intellectual property stuff has been sorted out. And then later on, they find out that there's four or five pages in the book, which is completely plagiarized from somewhere yeah. run into trouble. So I went to Japan to speak to Sol Side, <clears throat> a lot of stuff I wanted to talk to him about. Mm. And he was sat there silent for maybe a minute, which when you're sitting in front of Sol Side, Sol Side, Sol Side's one minute of silence is like... <laughs> A hundred man kumite. <laughs> you just, you know, you want to be anywhere except right there. And then he said to me, Have they got any good private schools in Australia, good international schools in Australia? Oh, that's a strange question. Because his daughter at that time was about 13 or 14. He was looking for an international school for her. Um, 15, I think she was. And so I said, All right, well, I'll go back and I'll have a look for schools and all this sort of thing. And, um, uh, and that was that. I'm thinking, gee, this didn't go according to plan. So I went around to Power Karate, and the, the manager of the Power Karate magazine was a gentleman named Inoue Sung, who was very nice. And this is 87. I'd trained, um, I'd lived in Japan for seven months in 85, trained at Hombu, and I'd been in Uchi Deshi in 84 for three months. So I was, and I had done a lot of interpreting at that time. So I was very familiar with Inuesa. We were, we were, and I turned up there and it was like running into a brick wall. Mm. Like there was absolutely no positive feedback. I'm thinking something's fishy here, you know. Mm. Um, as it turns out, all it was were, they hadn't even spoken to Solsai. It's just that they had a very clear specific policy when it came to Solsai's intellectual property. Mm, mm. And if someone wanted to see one of Solsai's photos, which they were the depository of Solsai's photos, they just like, you know, mm. it's nice weather today. What are you doing in Japan? They won't even discuss it or, wow. or entertain the idea. So I went round and, and I'm waiting. And then after this is Tuesday on Thursday, I heard that Solsai was heading to Okinawa with his family for a bit of a holiday. This was summer in Japan, probably July or so. And he wasn't going to be back by the time I leave on that trip. So I knew I had to do something. So what I did is I did a Japanese outline of the table of contents. Mm -hmm. And I explained everything that was in it. And I gave that to Vera, Vera De Lee, Solsai's secretary, who's oh, now Vera Shinohe. Shinohe, yeah. Did you know that Vera, you know, Vera's Belgian and she's mm -hmm. very strong and tall. Mm -hmm. She's about five foot 10, maybe, mm. which is even five foot 11. I wouldn't be surprised. And Shinohe, as you know, he's like six foot two, six foot three. Mm -hmm. And their son, uh, Liu, they name one son Liu, which means dragon, and one son Tora, which means tiger. Wow. And 
Tora and Liu both have very strong significance in the martial arts world. But anyway, their son, Liu, went on to become the All Japan Open Weight Judo Champion a couple of years ago. And that was pretty significant. But anyway, Vera was also secretary. I gave it to her and and time the days are ticking and time's ticking and comes Saturday and we're all I'm there and we're just lined up out the front knowing that Solsai is about to leave and I've got the Solsai I really need to get this sorted speech you know of yeah what am I going to say to him in a polite way and he's saying goodbye to everybody because he won't be back for maybe a week or so and then he comes to me and he goes oh come in on he says go and speak to Vera and because she has a forward for the book for you and go and speak to Ino san at Power Karate. Beautiful. And I'm like, oh, have a good holiday. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as he's around the corner, I run up to Vera and we sorted out the forward and then I ran around to Power Karate. And as I walked in the door, Ino san just looks at me and, and shakes his head and goes, I don't know what happened but this has never happened before. And he wow. walked out with a pile of Soul Size personal photo albums. This is pre-digital, so there's no digital copy. Of course. He just says there, he said, please, and he gave me a uh, Soul Size personal copy of the first edition of What Is Karate, which had like all his handwriting where he had a red circle around a paragraph and um, an arrow here and across through a certain photo and, you know, notes for the second edition, which was coming up. Right. And, you know, his son's giving them to me as though, you know, he's the curator at the Louvre and he's giving me Mona mm. Lisa. Please look after these. And well put. Mm. I felt a strong responsibility too. So, of course, I didn't even want to take them with me. So what I did is I spent the next five, six hours going through all the photo albums right. and picking out all the photos that are in the book. And yes. Solsai had given me carte blanche, if you like, to use any of the photos that I wanted. Uh, and also he said I could take that copy of What Is Karate back to Australia and use that as a source reference. Beautiful. But I didn't take it back. I, oh. I didn't want responsibility. So what I did mm. is I just photocopied certain pages. Okay. Information. Uh, now I wish I took it back. I have a feeling I probably still have it if if I did. And yeah, which isn't it's not. I'm not being greedy, but I trust myself yes. when it comes to taking responsibility for that sort of thing. And today, gosh knows where it is and who's got it. Oh and man, I could imagine. That's what I mean. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you know, the, the, the gates of heaven have opened up. Yeah, and, indeed. And I've got Saul size not only permission, but his carte blanche authority. Ino Esan's mopping sweat off his forehead <laughs> because he's in charge of the depository. Mm. And I am this foreigner. He's just giving me everything. And then I've got the forward uh, from Saul size for the book, which is in the book of course mm -hmm. and so that's that i say goodbye to everybody and um head out to the airport completely over over limit with my luggage because i had a lot of spare time when solsai you know just waiting for solsai and then after he left on the saturday i had the sunday and the monday so i did a little bit of shopping i get out to the airport and i'm running late so the first miracle was my mate Pete calls me mm. and I haven't spoken to him since. Mm. The second miracle is this $300 airfare at a mm. time when that's really all I could afford. Yeah. The third miracle is that Solsai writes the forward from a book, which is the only forward he ever wrote for a foreign book. The fourth miracle is that Ino Esan is mopping sweat off his forehead because Solsai has given me carte blanche. And I think, well, that actually turned out really, really well. Yeah. yeah. So I get to the airport and I rush up and I check in. And they look at me 
and this is the fifth miracle, they look at me and say, we're really sorry, we've run out of economy seats. Do you mind being in first class? So <laughs> for $300, I get a first class seat coming back from Japan. Wow. And I'm there the whole time just flicking through these photos and... and Thank you very much. I'd started to uh, play with the manuscript. So yeah, that's how the, good's that. Thank yeah, you for sharing that. That's that is that is perfect. That is a great start in a way to appreciate, uh, you know, that moment for yourself, you know, and uh, uh, very well said, you know. So once that book, uh, once the book uh, was was released and 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 completed, you know. Uh, how, how we, you know, what, what an amazing response. I'm sure, you know, you would have said, geez, I wasn't, were you aware of, you know, how it was just going to be such a massive influence? Because again, you were doing it for your students as such to begin with, because of all the demands of, hey, what, what, what uh, from what I've heard from when you were explaining it, you were saying some of the students were requesting certain things. And then all of a sudden it's collated to be this thing. Yeah, it started out the terminology section in the back, basically, yeah. I, I Ronio'd copied, so it was like, you know, really early days of technology. I just did a three page um, handout for the new students of the technology. And then one day someone asked me the meaning of the names. And certain names I understood, and I got a handle on, certain names I had no idea why they were called that. So I just did a bit of research. And in the process of the research, I just uncovered more and more and more. Mm. And I always had, because I'd been doing the yoga as well as the karate for a long time, um, it just was a perfect opportunity to expand everything. So I just went from three page, a three page photocopied thing and just expanded out from there. Yeah. And who knows uh, what to expect at times like that. You know, you, you write it and you keep your fingers crossed. It's like you and your book that you've mm. recently written. And I hope it's doing really well. It is, thanks. Yeah. It's doing really well. But all you can do is hope, right? You just Correct. put it out there. And if people buy it, great. If they don't, you just sit back and go, well, that's done a little bit. And in those days, it wasn't digital. No. See, this, see, this is what they call the poor man's um, intellectual property. In, in this contains the card. The Christmas card, which I made, which nice. people are really enjoying. And it's got a 32 gigabyte memory stick with everything about the book. Right. And then you, you take it to the post office and it gets registered and it gets stamped on all the seams so you can prove that it hasn't been open since that time. So you now have legal claim to mm. owning mm. the material at that date mm. so if someone comes along and says it's like a black belt is a white belt who never gave up there you go which yeah. was my original thing and in my book my first edition of the book i wrote a beginner is a master i mean a master is a beginner who never gave up but then when i put it on the dojo wall i put a black belt as a white belt never gave up and that's my mm my own copyright and I mean, it's not all that original because I got it from a very obscure source which is Saint Therese of Avila a Catholic saint who said that a saint is a sinner who never gave up right eh? and I applied that to karate now that's a perfect example of what happens when you don't uh, take ownership of your yeah. intellectual property it then becomes public property you know and so everyone i see it now black belt is a white belt and never gave up it's elio a gracie a black belt <laughs> and a white belt and never gave up musashi you know it's yeah, just like yeah, everyone yeah. claims it um but by doing this you're assured that you can yeah of the intellectual property and you have to do that of yeah course. so shian how did how did sosa respond to the end product back then oh look i gotta tell you um Willie Schultz, shout out to my good buddy, Willie yeah, Schultz, Willie. who also did this book as well. Amazing. The original book in 87. Was one of my students then, but was also a very talented graphic designer. And uh, the book is going to be a black, 
it's it's hard to see, but this is a sample of the black linen. It's a linen yeah, finish nice. cover, and yeah. it's got gold embossing on it and everything. It'll Fantastic. be very beautiful. And when it was being printed in Brisbane, there was a big, if you could imagine, each cover is all made in a computer, in a, in a big machine, and the cardboard goes through, and then that uh, black linen uh, style paper is glued and stuck on, and they spat out the other end, and then they mm -hmm. make it. Well, there was a big sheet of that black linen um, with the gold embossing on it sitting there. And I said to the printer, do you mind if I keep that? Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, no, no worries. And I showed Willie. He said, give me that. I'll make a presentation box. Beautiful. So this time I've got this mailing box, right? Yeah. But Very cool. We didn't have that then. It was a, we just had a plain box. And what Willie did was he made this beautiful presentation wow. box out of that. So the front of it, if you could imagine, was that gold embossed yes. um, cover. Yes. With he put a little gold tassel on it, and like one of those ones that you've got the little loop like that, and yes. it goes through and locks it. And it was beautiful. And I had with the help of Mick Young and the boys, we all were going over to fight in the fourth world tournament. So, and would you believe the books came off the binding press that morning? That yeah, I've heard this story. You, can you share that? That that's another miracle as such really that came to, through. I really wanted to get the books to Japan. Mm. I was going over that day to fight in the all Japan uh, and the world tournament, fourth world tournament. And so I'm at the book binders at six o'clock in the morning. And luckily for me, when they've got a big job like that, they start very early. Yeah. So they're bringing them off. They're coming off the production line and being boxed up. And I grabbed the first six boxes, shook his hand and said, I'm out of here. I've got a plane to catch. So I turned up with six boxes of books and Mick Young uh, grabbed a couple between us. We were able to get the boxes on in extra luggage, and et cetera, et cetera. And in those days, uh, the flight we were on went via Hong Kong. So we had to cart them through Hong Kong. And I, to this day, I thank Mick Young. He probably still hates me for what I did. But I learned a lesson. I never asked anyone ever again to carry something for me because it must have been such a pain. Uh, anyway, we turn up with six boxes of books. That's six dozen books. And check into the hotel, which was the Metropolitan. Mm -hmm. So it was just around the corner from Hombu. Yep. And I walk over and all, oh, and I got sort of went to see Solsai. And oh, come in on her, all that. And mm -hmm. then he, I said, oh, I've got the book. I've finished the book. And he goes, oh, good, show me. And I pulled out Presento. that presentation box that Willie had made and cross my heart. Oh, wow. He got a tear in his eye. And mm. it was funny because he was, I think he was too embarrassed and fair enough, to show that he had a tear in his eye. Mm. So he cleared his throat and bent down at the side of the desk to adjust something. Mm -hmm. For as long as it took him to get control of his emotion. Mm. Like that, then he comes up and he's looking at this book. Whoa. It blew his mind. He just, he just well fell done. up with it. And of course, by that stage, his books were no longer available. So from 87 until probably into the 90s, perhaps, mm -hmm. he always had a pile of my books on his desk. And so when people had come, rather than give his book, which he didn't have any more of, right. a copy of mine, I never, in my ignorance, I never thought of getting him to autograph a copy. Oh. <laughs> so I don't have one. And also Bobby Lowe, of course, because I'd met Bobby Lowe What's... in 80, uh, 76. Mm -hmm. and we'd become quite close on a very personal level. I don't talk about it much because, uh, but I have a, uh, you know, a lovely collection of, of personal uh, correspondence and everything. But I approached him to see if he'd write the forward. And of course, as, as everyone knows, he wrote a forward for it too. So 
that was very exciting to wow. you know, have that as well. Yeah. Well, that's very cool. That uh, a nice little story there of also leaning over the desk and uh, <coughs> clearing the throat as such. Eh? That's yeah. very cheeky, but um, very I got sincere. A hand it to Willie. He, he did a beautiful job. It, it was well done. Like nothing I've ever seen. That presentation box was so beautiful. Well, the response thus far has been uh, fantastic. And again, obviously, we're doing this chat to encourage everyone, you know, and, um, you know, we'll, it's just, I just wanted to slide in a quick reminder, because we'll keep chatting for another 25, half an hour or so, but be sure to jump on. Xi'an, you were saying there is, you know, obviously, um, your website. So just slide that in for now for people, because they can jump online, maybe while they're listening to this, and you can start to pre-order your uh, copy. So what was the site just for now, just in, just in the middle of what we're talking about? Yeah, it's budokarate.com. Nothing's yep. changed. Yep. No www. Leave the www. Right. It's just budokarate.com. So you jump. can go there and order. Yep. Now, if you're a dojo operator or if you're Australian, simply because of postage rates and everything, mm. uh, get in touch with me directly. Mm -hmm. um, there should be a... It's just Cameron at budokarate.com. Um, you can contact me at my email there, Cameron at budokarate.com. Yeah. And tell me you want to get some bulk orders, etc. because uh, the website is, because it's international, it's all in US dollars. So if you're Australian, you'll save a few dollars on exchange rate by yep. doing it directly in Australian dollars to yep. my bank. There are different ways. So, yeah, yeah, so I wanted just to put that in quickly because then while we keep chatting, people might jump on and start pre-ordering for this sake. And um, and hopefully, the co well, from what I heard you were saying, the copies are, are, are aiming towards uh, uh, late January to be you know, distributed. Look, the, the, I, I've got the sample here. This is the sample in the yeah. box. Um, that's the sample. Beautiful. Now, it was meant to arrive... A month ago but with the tracking of dhl and everything i was able to watch its progress and during the progress there are five four or five points where it says uh held for customs quarantine checking and i asked what that was about and every time there's a transition in the process of going from the source to here everything would get stopped and checked mm. for COVID, you see? And so what would have been a three or four day journey actually became three or four weeks. And the printer has, printer said that the books would be ready a maximum of 28 days. They'll be in Australia 28 days after the order is finalized. So the book should have been here now. Yeah. That's right. But now they're saying the 28 days, because this was delayed for a start mm. and this needed approval. So the printing was delayed and now they're, they're, um, it's quite a process. Yeah. Now their, uh, time frame has blown out to about 45 days. So it means towards the end of uh, January, and right. even possibly beginning of February. But That's more cool. to the point is that I'm glad people are pre-ordering it because I'm just getting overwhelmed with orders. Perfect. Like a hundred copies. One guy in America bought a hundred copies. Another guy in Holland bought a hundred copies. The guy in UK, we started out, he was, there's one fellow there who's helping me distribute it. And we started out talking about sending in 300 copies. He's now ordered a thousand copies. Beautiful. So, and I've only printed well three thousand. So it's it. I really think it's going to run out again. Yeah. So that's why the pre-orders? Why we decided to do the pre-orders? Well, there's a nice reminder unlike, from like a digital copy that it is. There is a finite number of copies. Yeah. Well, you know, again, let's continue on with uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, because the original copy for those that ha have it and the ones that uh, jumped on eBay to try and uh, make a bit of money out of it, it was slowly ticking over for nearly a thousand odd dollars. So the, uh, the old copy 
uh, you know, had some currency behind it. So to those that uh, are pre-ordering, make sure you jump on, you know, and, 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 and get this as best you can and as soon as you can. So Xi'an, you know, there's been additional things that you've put into this new book. So, and, I, and again, on your YouTube channel, you shared uh, uh, in your weekly sessions that you've done um, some of the things that you've included and, um, you know, how, you know, what a, what, you know, over that last 30 years of when it was first released, you know, and now you have a window to put in more information and update people with certain things. Um, how did you go in deciding what you were going to put in? You know, you've changed a couple of your images. You've uh, drawn most of the images in there, or if not all of them. And so there would have been a, a nice little process, a nice uh, little bit of tossing and turning in the evenings, I feel, from your end, in deciding exactly what you would add, add in. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, the biggest thing is that the number of mentors who have mm. passed away since then. So uh, Masayama, of course, has passed away. Shihan Bobby Lowe has passed away. Jacques Sandalescu has passed away. John Blooming's passed away. Frank Everett, my instructor, who I dedicated the book to, has passed away. My own parents, who were very supportive, they've all awesome. passed away. Mrs. Awesome. Ayama. So, so for the dedication wow. of the book this time, I realized how that this is the dedication I, hard to see, but I'll wow. see if I can yep. it up. Yep. What I've done is simply dedicated it to all those Beautiful. wonderful souls who had such uh, influence in my life. You know, Hiroshige Shihan, who mm. was um, the instructor of Midori, Yamaki, Tsukamoto, all these great fighters. He was my instructor when I was at Hombu when I was 17 years old. He was only yeah. a brown belt, mm. Uti Deshi then. Um, I've included him as well because we became quite close. Uh, in fact, many years later, he said, I always thought it was wonderful that this 17 year old high school boy would come to Hombu and train. So I always thought if I grow up and have a family, I'll do similar. And he actually had five children, which is unusual for Japanese. Yeah, right. And he sent his son, we mm. called him Archie. His real name was uh, Atsushi, which is very hard for Aussies to say. So we knew him as Archie and Archie came out to Australia at 15 uh, along with Yusuke Fuji, who was the Kyokushinkan All Japan champion, who's now a uh, businessman in, in Moscow, would you believe? Wow. He originally went to teach Kyokushin there and stayed on. But Archie, um, Hiroshige Shihan sent his son Archie out to the dojo and he trained with us at the dojo for five years and um, lived in. Uh, lived uh, with me for a while and then because of certain circumstances ended up staying with a homestay and then mm -hmm. after he finished high school he did three years of high school whilst he was training and then he went on did another two years where he studied he did a, a tertiary degree um, at a TAFE college so that connection's pretty strong too yeah um, and it was a great opportunity for example I've got a section here which I, I had translated once before mm. uh, and I'd put it in a tournament program, but um, I'm just flicking through it now. No, that's cool. Uh, was Soul Size Last Words. Oh, yes. It was, it's, a, it's a translation I did <clears throat> of Soul Size uh, Last, this one here, section of chapter two. Okay. Whereas soul size last words and that's so things like that I was able to add and then of course you got very the new good. forward by Dolph Lundgren, Dolph Lundgren now which cool I think that, is yeah. very exciting because and it's exciting for me but it's I think it's really nice for Dolph Lundgren because mm. you and I know who he is mm -hmm. and a lot of people know who he is but a lot of people who know him through the movies don't realize his love and connection to Kyokushin Karate so when I was I was actually talking to my buddy, Tom Callahan, who's a good friend of Dolph Lundgren's. And after the conversation, I thought, yeah, that's interesting. I might approach Dolph. And I asked Dolph and he was, you know, um, happy to do it, which was wonderful for me. But the most exciting thing is I think this is going to give people an awareness mm. who, who he really was in the Kyokushin world. You know? He was multiple times national champion 
of Sweden, national champion of Australia, European champion. I mean, he was legitimately a seriously mm. feared Tokushin competitor. Yeah. It's great for me to have him right before it. And I think it's a great opportunity for him to let people know how much he loves Kokushin. One addition that uh, I really enjoyed and, and for those that uh, listen to it on Sean Cameron's YouTube channel, if you haven't, you must, was the addition of Jacques Jandalou, uh, if I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, what a Jacques beautiful... Jandalescu. Uh, what a beautiful story, Sean. And I, I hope you can share maybe for, for, uh, and give it justice in the next five minutes as such. But, you know, what, what, a, what a great addition that is um, to the book. Yeah, and it's wonderful. And his lifelong partner, Annie Gottlieb, was his wife, Annie Gottlieb, I'd met them for the first time in 76 as well. 76 is really pivotal, pivotal because that's when I was training at Hombu for the first time. And in September 76 was the eighth All Japan Championship. I think now we're up to about the 50th. But at that event, Oyama Shigeru, Oyama Yasuhiko, Miura, 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 Miyuki, uh, Shian Bobby Lowe, um, Luke Hollander, Peter Chong, Shihan, um, Antonio Pinheiro, mm. all these amazing names mm -hmm. were there. And I was interpreting for them. So I got to meet them all then and maintained a really, in those days, it was all longhand. Mm -hmm. And I was living in Japan as a single, as a, 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 the only um, non-Japanese person in my town. So I did an awful lot of letter writing. So I, I started a really nice correspondence with a lot of these people. And it was um, a great experience to have uh, met all these people because it really started a lifelong um, thing. I'm sorry, what were we talking about? With Jacques. That's yeah, right. and Jacques Sandalescu and Annie Gottlieb yes. were there too. And, and I just found him the, even then the most fascinating person mm. because he just didn't suffer fools lightly. And when you then go on to realize what he had been through in life, mm. Amazing. you understand why. Now, when I wrote the first book, I was seeking information. Remember, there was no internet. I was seeking information about him. And one of my Japanese friends gave me some information on him. I thought, oh, great. So I put it in the book. Later on, I realized that certain aspects of that were inaccurate because my friend, probably in good faith, had given me information taken from Karate Baka Ichidai, the, the cartoon um, about Soul Sai's oh, life. So, so. And in that, they kind of um, sensationalized the meeting between Soul Sai and, and Jacques Sandalescu. So I got that wrong, but this time I wanted to make sure I got it right. So, and I'm still really close friends with Annie Gottlieb. Um, I'm going to go and grab something and show you in a sec. Right. But uh, I corresponded with Annie and Annie just happens to be a writer, an author, and also a, a book um, editor. And I didn't ask her to edit the book, but I did ask her to edit that section. Yeah, or have a look nice. at it at least. And uh, she read it for me and helped me with some facts. But you're right. That life of Jacques Sandalescu, which he has documented in a book called Don Bass. Don Bass is the uh, is the, um, the 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 river basin area in Ukraine where he was sent and put in the coal mines as a sixteen year old kid. Amazing story. He, was, yeah. he looked like a man, but he was on his way to school, uh, and they took him off the street and put him in the coal mines. Yeah. And the story of his, he was so close to death in a cave in and he was saved by his good buddy, dragged himself out. He's a polyglot. So he speaks six languages. He under, he could overhear the medical staff discussing the fact they're going to have to amputate his, his leg. leg yeah. They didn't want to do that. So he wrapped his legs in bed sheets and wire and snuck out of the hospital and buried himself in the coal of an open face coal um, carry, uh, carriage and worked his way over to uh, Germany. Yeah. That story of survival is breathtaking. It really is. 
You but shared I, his you shared his relationship with Sosa though that again many of us uh, you know, younger younger gen as wouldn't have appreciated but you got to see the 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 love that they both had for each other that grew. It was unbelievable. I mean, and I, again, I didn't really appreciate why fully until many years later. But they had an unspoken understanding of each other's tribulations. Mm. You know, Solsai as a Korean in post-war Japan was going through all kinds of, you know, unspeakable challenges. And Jacques also knew what it was like to be cold and hungry and alone in a foreign place. So he, he saw Solsai and met Solsai through his friend and pretty well understood the situation he was in, so invited him in. And mm -hmm. Solsai slept on his couch for six months in, in New York, you know, and they developed an amazing friendship. And Jacques had a couple of jazz bars, mm -hmm. which is another story in itself. The, yeah. the names of the performers who have performed at his jazz bars is quite amazing. But more than once, um, they'd have to turf some you know, pretty unsavory characters out of jazz bars and so on. So he tells amazing stories of there's, you know, six foot four, six foot five Jacques, a heavyweight boxing champion, and little five foot nine Masayama, who would be minimized by everybody. They look at Jacques and they look at Masayama and go, well, he's nothing. And <laughs> baby said, yeah, that was the worst thing you could have done. You know, so he tells, I didn't put stories about there's certain things you just can't. No, no, no. Wonderful so, stories of their relationship. Please go and check that out for all. And I can't wait to read that. Uh, you've read it out, but I can't wait to read it uh, personally. So, Xi'an, you know, we've got about 10 more minutes or so. And we appreciate your time. What's um, What's been the additional thing that you've loved in this, uh, you know, over the last, again, uh, amount of years that you could have had things in there and you probably tossed and turned when you did the first edition and many feedback and so many people would have added their opinions and thoughts to, you know, I'm getting it now. It's, it's unreal. Oh yeah. Oh, imagine you put that. Oh, okay. Well, I'll think about it next time. What's the, is there something that you'd like to share with us that you want us uh, that felt right that when you put it in or that you added because of the evolving and the evolution of what's occurred? Yeah, look, I think when I wrote it, I was a tournament fighter. Now I'm in my 60s. Yeah. So one of the beautiful things I appreciate about karate is the kata and that graceful artistic aspect of kata, which also has those wonderful layers of practicality. And, you know, I often wonder what boxers and kickboxers do after they retire from the ring you know, and they can maintain the bags and they skip for a while and they work the speedball. But you see karate guys can have a totally focused kata session at 75, 80 years old and not for one moment get bored. There's still the beginner's mind is going on. And so I expanded the kata section Right. Um, which I think is quite interesting from my perspective. Yeah. I really love that area of it. Uh, other areas that I expanded are um, I was able to verify more clearly a lot of the facts about Solsai's life. Mm. And so I really wanted to make it very clear because there are some people who are putting videos on YouTube minimizing Solsai and um, completely not understanding what they're talking about. Sure. And sometimes they base their discussions, their, their videos on a discussion with Bobby, with uh, Xi'an John Blooming. Yeah, of course. And John Blooming was a bit like Jacques. They didn't suffer fools lightly. And John mm. Blooming just, people have to understand that his knowledge of Kyokushin was very strongly influenced by Kurosaki Sensei as well. So... It's very easy when John Blooming talks about Solsai fighting steers and not um, bulls, bulls to misunderstand that he's disrespecting Solsai. But if you could have ever, I spent many hours with John Blooming listening to him with a tear in his eye. He loved Solsai so much. Mm. He, just, he was in love with him. He, he was a top judo player, monstrously strong, 
who went around with the influence of Don Drager, the famous Don Drager, yes. who was also influential in the Sean Connery connection because I think he was supervising, he was called in to supervise the stunt work and so on. And all the Kyokushin guys were doing the stunt work because he was training, Don Drager was training with Masayama. Yes. And Don Drager introduced Don Bloomy to Masayama. And you've got to realize that as much as John Blooming, loved, well, he for a start, he left Kyokushin before Kyokushin really got going. Yeah. Kyokushin well before the first world tournament. So his perspective of what Kyokushin is, is very different. Mm. But that doesn't withdraw, doesn't draw from the fact that he really loved Solsa. So yeah. he was an iconoclast. He just didn't suffer fools lightly. The only person over the years, I kind of facilitated a meeting between him and Jean LaBelle mm. and they met each other, but I trained with Jean in America and he was like a, an incredible presence in judo in North America. Yes. And of course I knew John Blooming and he was this incredible presence in judo in Europe, but they never met. So I wrote That's... about their meeting in the book, which is fascinating. And I speak to Jean LaBelle every week. I speak to him once a week, once a oh, week. No. And just the other day when I was speaking to him, he mentioned John Blooming again. Mm. And he's just saying, what a nice guy. And he really knows his stuff. Yeah. And John Blooming, I mean, Gene LaBelle doesn't say that about anyone. He yeah. doesn't disrespect people. He'll go, yeah, great guy, really nice guy. Oh, man, what a gentleman. And that's his way of saying he thinks his martial arts is crap. But he would never say, no, his martial arts is crap. <laughs> but he's a really nice guy. Yeah, sure. So when it comes to John Blooming, he said, really nice guy, great guy, but he really knows his stuff. Yeah, nice. You know, Beautiful and and, yeah. and I'd said to John Blooming, have you heard of Gene LaBelle? No, I've never heard of him. And he was always cynical, just, you know, you know, if I've never heard of him, he couldn't be very good. And then out of the blue, I get a message from him. I'm in LA and I'm going to go and meet your friend, Gene LaBelle. And then I get another message the next day going, boy, oh boy, that guy really knows his stuff. Nice. You know, so Gene, John Blooming was the same. You know, he, he, he was so good at what yeah. he did that he just like, he just didn't waste his time entertaining, you know, nice stories about, oh yeah, no, he really, oh yeah, he's really good. He just said, no, he couldn't do anything yeah. to me. I just picked him up, you know. So well, anyway, um, that too. That's it, been it, included in some way. Well, yeah. Goal size training at the Sone Judo Dojo. I was able to expand on that. The right. Masahiko Kimura, you know, Kimura is one of those few people in the martial arts whose name now becomes common vernacular because all the BJJ guys call the Udegarami or Gyaku Udegarami to be accurate, call that the Kimura, you know. So the story of his connection, he was actually an assistant instructor at Sone Chu and Yamaguchi Gogen's dojo, karate dojo, mm. you know. The story of him um, learning Makiwara and using Makiwara to make the help judo. him. Yeah. Uh, I, the whole thing, I think, I think is so fascinating to have this opportunity to expand on all these things which have been important to me. Yeah. Well, there you go. And it, thank you for sharing that as well. And that's a nice uh, way for all of us to start to appreciate, you know, the. The amount of years, and you're always getting reference, Yan. You know that uh, your, your knowledge and your experience over those years in in translating for Sosai and meeting all these people. But yeah, now to get a little bit more clarity and and for you to tidy up a bit of the um, stories that are you know going around, it helps my generation indeed to make sure we can reference them as you as you put it. So well done, um, Chian. Let, let, you know we can summarize it from here. You know, congratulations to you. Uh, well done, you know, uh, what I can't wait to see it, to feel it and to touch it and all that and everyone to own it. And um, I guess in summary, you know, the floor is yours for now in, in just sharing what you'd like to share to everyone in, in how they pre-order, what the next steps are and, and whatever you'd like to say, go for it. Oh, well, thanks, Patty, for having me along. Um, and thank you to everybody who has jumped on and ordered so many copies. I'm so excited. I've had orders from Iceland mm. to Brazil and everywhere in between. Orders from Japan even, um, from people I didn't even know could read English and maybe they can or can't, I don't know. 
but it's it's really really exciting to think that it's gained that kind of traction um and it's very humbling i hate to say i'm i'm humbled and grateful because that sounds so cliche mm -hmm. and people say it all the time but genuinely i am when i when i look at some of the people who've ordered this book and they're like my heroes you know these how oh, good these guys were the best of the generation you know mm. and to see the effect that the books had on people's lives and mm. you know i've never had a phone call that there's two types of phone calls i never got one i never got a phone call from someone saying oh hi my name's pete i've been your student for 25 years and gee i regret that the phone call you get is hi my name's pete i trained with you when i was mm. at high at university and they were the best days of my life but i stopped training and i really regret not keeping up with the kyokushin training yes. i think that's the first sort of phone call i get the other phone call i get is i never get a phone call from someone who says i bought that book and gee it was disappointing <laughs> What I get is I bought that book and lent it to someone and I never saw it again. That's it. The and squirrels. I'm mm. looking for that squirrel. But, you know, so it's very satisfying to know yeah. that uh, because it was probably the first book to address the connection between original yoga and the origins of martial arts. And I right. point out in the book that Shingi Tai, right? Yeah. Mind, the technique and the body. And Salsai pointed out to me once that in terms of Shin Gi Tai, Shin, the mind, generally speaking, finds its origin in India. Mm -hmm. So it's the breathing techniques and the meditation techniques and the spiritual aspect of martial arts. Gi, Waza, the techniques, generally speaking, find their origin in China. So all the, the stances and even the Sun Shin and the Tensho and everything all came to Okinawa from China yes. and Thai, the physical, generally speaking, the signature physical training that is evident in martial arts in Japan is the Japanese approach to conditioning, which is specifically, so also I pointed out, specifically the lower body training, the importance placed on hips and legs. And you've only got to look at the Yamakis and, mm. and Midoris and Kazumis and Matsui's to know that that incredible strong flexibility in the lower body is a signature of good karate. So mm -hmm. I found that fascinating as well. And, and I think it's just um, time's right. You know, yeah. I, could say that I should have done it 20 years ago, but if I did it 20 years ago, I don't think it'd be anywhere near as, as good. So I'd say the timing's perfect. You know? Well, Xian, thank you again for your time. Congratulations. And, um, you know, thank you for joining us. And, and to everyone out there, do the math, you know, jump on buddhakarate.com. Is that correct, Xian? And, um, yep. and get your orders in and let's support Xian as best we can with all the work and time and effort and energy and sacrifice and commitment and all the above. And, and I appreciate your support with my book, um, Xian, you know, Forever the Student. It was uh, something that, um, you know, gave me some therapeutic ways as well. And following you all year, I wanted to thank you personally, um, you know, for all your sessions that you've done on YouTube um, and your generosity and time. And uh, it was such a big influence to me over COVID as well. And just uh, joining, uh, having Lennox join me with it and uh, us listening to you in our living room while we're stretching. And uh, I wanted to pass that on to you as well. So congratulations. And to all of you out there, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Um, be sure to jump on to Xi'an Cameron's YouTube channel um, and all the above. And let's all have a safe uh, new year. Xi'an? Awesome. Thank you very much, Patty. And good luck with the book. Good luck with the return. I'm so glad that you're able to hang in there. I'm sure mm. it must have been pretty close for you and Mark Cassanini yes. at the gym there. Yeah. The tough times. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends in Victoria really, really are under the mm. under the gun. So well done for coming through and good luck with that. And yes, 
budokarate.com, get along. And if you're, if you're a dojo operator, you want to order 10 or more, get in touch with me personally and we'll work out a uh, discount rate. I'm giving a 20% discount for bulk orders. Beautiful. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Stay safe to everyone. And yeah. we can't wait for the book and yeah. we'll be in touch uh, when it's obviously out. Us, everyone. Us. Uh, thank you, Patty. <laughs>